Good afternoon. I'm Amar Sharma, and I'm Director of Software Engineering at NBC Universal. Um, we support the Ad Sales Division, and I'm going to give you guys a 30-minute talk about our journey from being a traditional media company, monolithic, um, vendor management type of shop, to a pretty lean, agile, uh, build, app dev kind of organization. So just a couple disclaimers. Um, none of this content is mine. It's all borrowed and stolen from Stanford D School, Pivotal, Pivotal Labs, um, Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science, um, Jim Hightower, and we've just kind of adopted some of the ideas and modified them. I'm by no means telling you how you guys should run your shops. These are just some of the lessons that we learned along the way. So to start off, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background, some context about why this change was important to us and what the implications were if we weren't to change. So on the right hand side is your traditional mediums of television. That's probably what you think of when you think of TV, um, broadcast, ABC, NBC, CBS, um, the cable networks, USA's, Vice's, Vox's of the world. Um, but that paradigm is starting to shift. So now people are more so consuming content on tablets, mobile phones. Um, you can get content through dot coms um, via full episode players. There's OTT offerings like HBO Go and there's connected television. So if you don't want to do any of that, you can probably find the content on the Internet for free. So these are all new elements that have entered our industry and market in the past couple of years. And We've got to change, we've got to adapt so that we can keep pace. So this is slightly dated. This is from, a, a, it's a differential between Q1 of 2013 and Q1 of 2014. But it just kind of shows you that live television, Blu-ray consumption is essentially negative and people are now starting to consume more time in a, a single month um, on their smartphones, via the internet, gaming consoles, um, and, and via their PCs. So to stay relevant, NBC's gotta make some changes. Just a quick overview of, of, of NBC. Um, pretty much everything on the left-hand side of this uh, is, is what we work on and support. So a whole bunch of broadcast television, about 23 different cable properties, um, some digital businesses, and then the other side of the house has got film, studios, international, and parks just kind of gives you size and scale. Usually people just think of a peacock when they think of NBC these days, um, but there's a lot more in the portfolio that we support. Just to give you some kind of size and scale, um, ad sales for NBC, which is the vertical that we build applications and software for, um, distribute about 5 million commercials last year. Um, a couple bucks a commercial, it comes out to about $11 billion of revenue. So what that means for us is there's definite opportunity to absolutely preserve that revenue share um, within the market and try to figure out ways to grow it. So 1% of that, if we can find 1% across a couple deals, over $11 billion pays for my team, plus a whole lot of other cool stuff for you know, the next 10 years. So there's really a, a real ROI play here if we can solve the right business problems and come up with elegant solutions. So just a bunch of logos. I would say these are what you would think of as our traditional competitors, um, true media platforms. I would say this is who our real competitors are today. Netflix, Facebook, Google, Amazon, all continually starting to chip away at our market share, trying to disrupt that $11 billion of cash flow. Um, and they're doing it with some of the best data, some of the best people, and some of the best technologies. So we had to change the way that we were doing things um, just to stay relevant. So we've made some investments in both technology, data, people, a better go-to-market scheme, and um, we've wrapped that all around building you know, best-in-class products, and that kind of brings us to the point at, about three years ago where we partnered up with Pivotal Labs um, to do our first custom build from the ground up. And that's where we had a lot of good learnings. Um, the, one, the one key learning that I've, I, I use this slide essentially somewhere in almost every deck that I, that I pitch. And uh, it's an Andrew Clay Schaefer quote, 
Um, you can follow them at the little idea. And you're either building a software business or you're losing to somebody who is. And in our case, that is the Googles, the Netflix, um, the Facebook video live now um, that we kind of have to keep up with to remain relevant. So this is where our journey kind of started. Um, we, we realized that you know, we've got a diversity of different problem statements. We've got a huge amount of first party data. We can leverage third party data. Um, we happen to be um, a, a child company of Comcast, so there's probably some, some data synergies there too. Um, and you know, we've got a, a growing volume of these, these different data sources and we need to start leveraging them so that we can, uh, we can come up with better solutions. So this next slide is the core principles of, of Pivotal Labs. We went down there, um, we met a lot of really smart people in a very open and thought-provoking environment. But, and, and these were the kinds of things that they were focused on. Individuals versus, and interactions over process and tools, um, working software as opposed to documentation, um, customer collaboration versus dollars um, in the bank, and responding to change as opposed to following a plan. So coming from a very traditional IT shop, a lot of these things were very disruptive ideas. And you know we had some initial frictions because our folks didn't know how to work this way. Pivotal Labs didn't want to work any other way. And you know we needed to come to some type of happy medium. So fast forward a little bit, and this is kind of where we landed. Um, we took a lot of the approaches and a lot of the key learnings and um, we started doing design first, rapid prototyping. Um, we built smaller, more agile, cross-functional teams. Um, and I'll dive into that a little bit deeper. Um, we started following more of a microservices architecture um, that led us to building micro components within our stacks. And we looked for full stack folks to hire um, because this is not just a process problem, it's also very much so an organizational problem. So we took a lot of those core competencies and core principles and we kind of distilled them down into what NBC could bring back home to the enterprise and this is where we landed. Um, we, we run a technology agnostic shop, so we're constantly sandboxing new technology. Um, we, we base all of our design around the user, and I've got another good cheat sheet slide in here, um, stolen from the Stanford D School, that helps you work through that methodology. Um, we do TDD, so we write about as many tests as we do features just to make sure that we're balanced, our code quality is good, and as you start to introduce new members of teams or members start to roll off, you, you empower developers to be able to make changes confidently as opposed to being fearful that they're gonna break something or, or bring an entire application down um, because you have no test coverage. Um, CI CD is, uh, is something that we, we've gotten to, um, made some investments in Jenkins and it's really, really tightened our iterative software development li life cycle. So within a, a single day, you know, we probably push out three, four builds. We're not necessarily at the Amazon scale where they're doing, you know, 11 builds every sub second into production. Um, but we're still on that journey starting to get there. Um, and then paired or peered review. Um, in the last talk, you heard about balanced teams and co-location. This is something that we couldn't necessarily afford to do because real estate in Midtown New York is really expensive. So we've got remote teams. Um, we've got a pull request process that works for us really well. Um, you got to get a thumbs up before stuff gets committed and merged into master and then pushed to production. Um, so that's been something that the teams kind of worked through and uh, has been really successful. And, you know, we eat our own dog food. So analytics are not just to provide um, ways to make more money for NBC, but it's ways for us to figure out what's working and what's not working so we can divest things that aren't. The roles that we've got, and this is, this is a very simple slide, um, and say this is what comprises of you know, most, most teams these days. Um, the few things that I will call out on this one are um, we don't have any designers. We don't have true designers. What I look for is a team of unicorns. So 
They're usually called full stack designers these days, or sometimes they're called um, front end engineers and designers, but it's basically somebody who can empathize with the users and go all the way from understanding use cases from a user and a business all the way to writing front end Angular code if, if that's the framework of choice that day. Um, we found that to be successful and pretty scalable. The challenge there is finding unicorns is pretty tough, um, but we've wrapped a good testing methodology around it so that we can keep top talent and we can find top talent. Um, the other role in here that looks a little odd or awkward is uh, the technical product management role. So when interfacing with labs, the one thing that they, that they don't do a lot of is documentation. So what we did was we put in a technical product manager to help with the architecture and the, and the documentation pieces. This is also a, a very big facilitation role. So uh, a tech PM will essentially go between the product and the development team and help knock down roadblocks, fix technologies, um, in, interface with our, our legacy shared services organizations. A lot of stuff that A, devs don't want to do, Pivotal Labs is definitely not going to do, and um, our product owners aren't well equipped to do. And then I think the final thing that, that's key here is this wasn't just a technology shift for NBC. Um, it was also a, a product shift. So we went from basically having 25 different vendor apps that we were running in an environment and our product teams very much so got used to writing 16, 18, 50 page FDs and describing how they wanted to build products through big, you know, cumbersome documentation. And we've been able to partner with Pivotal to learn a lot of the best practices, thinking about lean design, thinking about how to come to an MVP, not over engineering solutions. That's something we're still working on, um, but I would say that's been one of the main value adds that we've gotten is just better, well-rounded product folks that think about technology the way true technologists would. So this slide doesn't necessarily fit perfectly um, from a transition standpoint, but I think it's a great cheat sheet that was stolen from the D school at Stanford um, where design thinking was essentially created. Um, this is how our, our unicorns iterate through very quickly through prototypes and come up with what our MVPs usually end up being. So the first step is to find some users, figure out what their business problems are and empathize with them. Ask them for stories, don't ask them for solutions um, and try to figure out really what the crux of the problem is. Next, you'll end up probably redefining the problem statement that you thought you were going in to solve um, in the design phase. Once you've got that, those insights and a fresh perspective, um, it helps you redefine or define exactly what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And then you ideate. And this one sounds super corny, but you just get a bunch of people in a room a whiteboard, a bunch of stickies, and you don't say no but to anything. You say yes and to every idea that's presented and you try to build on ideas. And then you probably come up with 50 ideas depending on size and scale of the problem. And then you can easily boil that down to which ones are gonna work, which ones are viable. Um, and then you take them to the prototype phase. Really rough, really crude. We don't spend a lot of investment on high fidelity mocks. My preference is something that's crude that we can get some immediate feedback on or working almost productionalized code. But, you know, glossy Photoshops is not really how we run our shop. And then we basically take that prototype and we show our users that we started engaging with to begin with. Once that's done, we basically start over. So everything is essentially in a big loop. Um, and that kind of transitions me over to test-driven development and CI, CD and why that's important. Um, basically, it allows you to give developers a comfortable place to commit code. Sure, it does take cycles away from you know, features and things that you might need to get into production, but 
it definitely gives you a better operational plan. It helps you bring products to market in a more safe, stable, reliable manner. So I think this is important. And then when you couple that with uh, CI, CD, you can then run those test suites in an automated fashion. Um, I'm sure there's a talk here that'll dive deep into um, exactly how you wanna implement that. But we found that's really helped our teams um, be able to be more fluid. So instead of keeping people kind of pigeonholed to one product for, for two, three years because they're the only one that knows that code base, it gives me some fluidity within the resourcing model to move people around, to keep people fresh, to keep people interested in solving new problems. So that being said, we've been able to continue to iter iterate and we've gotten to a good scalable platform, which is PCF. Um, we've been able to decouple a lot of our presentation layers from our backend service layers. Um, we've started to make investments in a mature DevOps so that we're not taking cycles away from our core developers who should be developing features. And we've got people that are helping us make things more repeatable and automated. And through that, we've been able to deliver really elegant, sexy solutions that help our client partnership and engagement. So that was a lot of process stuff. This is kind of the nuts and bolts of like what we've done and where we've come from. So in the top left, you see basically where we started. There's a big blue box that says mainframe. Um, there's a little bit of custom development in there, but essentially this represents 19 different systems that all had their own support models and support costs and were supporting every individual business at NBC disparately. So there was no opportunity for analytics, there was no opportunity for, for data mining, all that stuff would have had been dumped into a warehouse, homogenized, ETL'd, and then we potentially could have gleaned some learnings from it. So what we've been able to do is consolidate about 1,000, 1,200 users onto one system, which represents 24 different networks and about $11 billion of revenue. And that's really enabled us to have a lot of cost savings across the board. Um, it's also given us one canonical data model, and that data model has allowed us to enable a lot of different things. So on the top here, you see some of the analytic applications that we've been able to produce. Um, so in partnership with Pivotal Labs, we've built an application called PAM. Um, we also built an application called Sellout. So these two apps together help us manage when cash flows are coming into the business, how we're pacing from a financial targeting standpoint to this year's targets, and then at a finer grain, it lets us model our finite inventory so that we know if we've sold 80%, you know, it's probably time to start increasing that price point because now we're running out of you know, our limited commodity. Where we're gonna take this next is we're gonna build some platforms that enable programmatic exchange of commercials. So if you think about um, you know, how digital works today, it's a very much so a, a programmatic um, order acceptance, order management and fulfillment workflow. And we're gonna start taking the linear business into that. And you've probably heard some press releases about NBC UX. Um, essentially what that meant for my team was we need to build a whole bunch of microservices that allow us to expose a lot of our data assets, our rate card, our inventory, um, the selling titles and programs that we wanna monetize um, programmatically through pipes to DSPs, doesn't matter who they are, we built a generic set of services that anybody can subscribe to and they can then submit their orders programmatically, we can do some analysis on them and then we can then execute them. So that's one, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, um, is addressability. So if I never have to see a tampon commercial again, I will be a better person. If I only got Patagonia commercials, golf commercials, Burton commercials, you know, I think that my, my conversion rate, which means I see a commercial, I buy an object, would be much higher. So that's where we're trying to drive the business now. Um, we're looking at targeting audiences as opposed to 
the old Nielsen paradigm, which was not a very good currency because, you know, everybody is essentially a person either two plus or, you know, 18 to 49. So that doesn't really tell me a lot about people. What I want to get a better understanding of is where do I find households at a certain monetary value who are potentially looking for a car and own a pet and then provide that information to advertisers and agencies so that they can custom tailor their commercial delivery and their experiences so that they're actually relevant to you. So this is kind of taking it down one more grain. Um, this is essentially a, a high level, you know, boxes and lines of our architecture. Um, what we've been focusing on is the top layer of boxes, building elegant applications um, that solve relevant business problems within our application tier. Um, we've plugged in a few different reporting mechanisms. So we've done some traditional BI solutions. We've also done some custom ground up builds um, within a Java stack and within a Rails stack to provide analytics and to provide different reporting mechanisms for our businesses so that they know exactly where they are pacing financially, where there's still dollars left over, how does my inventory look. We've also made some of those workflows interactive um, within mobile experiences. Um, so we've got probably 15 apps within, within the ecosystem at this point and three mobile applications just enabling workflow. And this is all just the back office kind of, you know, how do we make more dollars off of our commercials? The next piece that I think we're diving into now and we're trying to solidify is our, our services and our data mart. So we want to be able to just generically pull data out of the system, dump it into a mart, and then enable our users to use a tool like Tableau or other Viz tools so that we don't necessarily have to can all of their, their learnings for them and they can have some accessibility to the data um, and they can make their own learnings. The other piece that we've been focused on is a microservices architecture and super buzzword these days, but we've found that looking at our finite spectrum of, of domain, which is NBCU linear ad sales, it's pretty simple to go through and find the, bind, the bounded contexts and create small microservices and small microservice teams around these contexts so that we can agnostically supply data to anybody else at NBC that wants to subscribe to it. And more importantly, we can enable things like programmatic and advanced targeting platforms so that we can change the way our end users are experiencing their commercial payloads. So just some key takeaways. I would say that you know everything is iterative. Our whole process, our whole journey has been iterative. If you talked to me three years ago, we wouldn't necessarily have been at a place where I would say that our teams and our organizations had a firm understanding of this. So we've gone through probably four or five different life cycles um, surrounded around our upfronts, which cannibalize pretty much 80% of our inventory and produce about 80% of our cash flows. Um, so we've done that about three or four times now. Um, flexibility has been key. Um, not pinning ourselves to one type of technology, not pinning ourselves to one type of process, and just adapting to new business functionality that I can't necessarily predict, but we can just try to layer technology in as a foundation to stay ahead. Um, quality is something that we continually focus on because I'm not trying to get called at two in the morning because an app is down because we put in some crappy commit that nobody reviewed and now we got to figure out who put the commit in and then we got to get the guy on the horn and then we have to roll it back. It's just not something that we're interested in. Um, from, a, from a developer standpoint, we've, we focus on continued teachings and continued learning. So we try to keep our environment very collaborative. Um, we try to offer different offerings to, to learn new technologies. Um, I've got a, a team that's based in uh, Ruby on Rails, and we've slowly been getting them to migrate over to, to working in a Java stack. And I've got a few engineers who started in a Java stack who have learned Groovy and 
um, and Ruby on Rails along the way. So we try to keep it, you know, mixed and and not keep people focused on one technology or one product for too long. Um, a sustainable pace. So this is where we can't necessarily adopt the full pivotal model where you got to be in at stand up at nine and you get cut loose at six and hands are off the keyboard at six o'clock. Um, because we've got business deliverables and everybody at NBC only cares about a timeline. So what we've been able to do is at least when our business cycles die down, so we're a May to May shop. So we do our planning and we figure out what we're gonna do starting in May. We start the implementation around September, October, and then all of our deliverables have to be in production for the upfront by next May. So as soon as June comes along, I shut the whole shop down. Basically tell people, we're not writing any stories, everybody's gonna read white papers, do discovery, and they're gonna work on things that they haven't been able to work on. So that's like my 20% of Google's time back manifested a little bit differently. Um, efficiency and reuse, I mean, this one's pretty obvious. You just don't wanna build things twice. Uh, make sure that you keep a couple smart people at a hypervisor layer that are touching all your apps um, so they know that, you know, we built this over here, let's just make it a reuse reusable component or reusable service and leverage it somewhere else. Talent is something that NBC didn't have a real good model for. So about three or four years ago, I went on the internet, I found uh, MIT's cracking Google's interview, stole all the coursework, leafed through it on train rides, and came up with a really good way to go through a technical interview process that helps me find the right talent and attract the right talent. And then I've taken that test and kind of given it to all of the, the folks on the team. And then we have like a collaborative vetting process when we're finding people. Um, and don't be afraid of technology. Um, there's a huge community out there. Open source is definitely the way to go. So moving forward, um, things that we're gonna be focusing on are continuing to implement microservices and micro components, um, event storming, which is essentially just another different word for Pivotal's, um, Pivotal's process. We continue to lean forward on our design first approach. Um, we wanna build some data pipelines and uh, we wanna stay in a, in a cloud first state of mind as we move into the future. And here's my, uh, my selfish plug. The Olympic games are in four days. Um, we've got a really, really close uh, integration with Comcast's X1 platform. So if you've got that, you're gonna see some really, really cool experiences where you can watch games, get metal updates. Um, and then if you don't happen to have X1, we've got an offering on every platform possible. So you can watch it on the web, NBCOlympics.com. You can watch it on your phone via the NBC Olympics app, um, or you can just turn on your TV and go to one of our properties and you should be able to get, you know, all of the Olympics highlights that you want to watch. So I'll stop there. We've got about five minutes left um, and I'll open it up to the floor for questions. Yes. So essentially the handoff is at the presentation layer. So UI and the data microservice will come to a contract and agreement of this is how I wanna consume data. Um, the full stack essentially ends at the presentation layer and that's where the UX folk pick up the work. Um, they agree on a, con a contract, they build a small micro component depending on what the use case might be um, that subscribes to a or a set of microservices that then enable that workflow. So is the UI in some sense a monolith? Is what I'm here? Uh, it, as in, do the, the components have separate deployments or in some in some cases, they have separate deployments. In some cases, they have one monolithic deployment. But with 15 apps, it's been easy to take that paradigm and move it forward. What it's gonna take a, a long time to do is kind of go back and refactor. Any other questions? Yes. So 
So the question was, are we using the Netflix components within the PCF platform? Um, and we are. So our, our microservices will subscribe to Circuit Breaker, Eureka services. Um, they're then discoverable and, and, and fault tolerant. So that's a really good question. And the question was, you know, what are the tangible benefits that you've seen by implementing this process? Um, I think just overall, the things that we've been able to enable um, from a custom build standpoint, some of the reporting requirements, some of the, the what if modeling, it's really difficult to tie a tangible, you know, we made a lift of 0.5% on this particular property. But what we've seen is good analytics in our uh, Google Analytics user adoption. So as long as the users are using this data, there's one canonical model and there's not 15 or you know, 25 different spreadsheets to manage at a C-level suite, I think we've definitely made impact. From an operational standpoint, just getting out of the licenses, the contracts, the support models, that was an initial cost savings of about $5 million. We've also been able to reduce headcount, et cetera. So there have been, you know, some tangible ROI. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs>